Ooh, excuse me. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7. Let's see. It says in verse 9, After these things I looked, and here was an enormous crowd that no one could count, made up of persons from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in long white robes and with palm branches in their hands. They were shouting out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. This is John's vision of the nations coming together, becoming the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. This is John's vision of what heaven is like. And wouldn't you know everyone's there from every nation, an uncountable crowd. And it says in verse 13, Then one of the elders asked me, These dressed in long white robes, who are they? And where have they come from where they came from? But you know what? John is actually doing something quite clever here. He's alluding to Ezekiel chapter 38. So go ahead and turn back to Ezekiel chapter 38, which I happen to have marked because I've had far too much time to prepare. Excuse me, chapter 37. I had that written down wrong. In Ezekiel chapter 37, Ezekiel has a vision. The Lord leads him into this valley and it says, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and placed me in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. He made me walk all around among them. I realized there were a great many bones in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said to him, Sovereign Lord, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over the bones and tell them, Dry bones! Listen to the Lord's message. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. Look, I am about to infuse breath into you and you will live. I will put tendons on you and muscles over you and will cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will live. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. There was a sound when I prophesied. I heard a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. As I watched, I saw tendons on them. Then muscles appeared, and skin covered over them from above, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, this is what the sovereign Lord says Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these corpses so that they may live. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet. A great army. This gives me goosebumps every time I read it. It really does. And here... People have come from every tribe, every nation, every language to praise God. And the angel says to John, he says, where have they come from? He says, Lord, you know. Then he said to me, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, they, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They will never go hungry or be thirsty again. And the sun will not beat down on them nor any burning heat. 
because the lamb in the middle of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is John's vision of heaven, but not just John's vision of heaven, but what it means to be the church because our job as the church is not simply to get to heaven, but to bring a little bit of heaven back to where we live. Just as it says in verse 17, the lamb will shepherd us and lead us to springs of living water. Isn't that amaz an amazing image? Here we see God reversing the roles that we expect there to be. The lamb is the shepherd leading us to springs. And God himself has brought us from a land of burning heat, from a land of dry bones to a, to a land of living water. That is what it means to be the church. That is what it means to be God's children. Mm. That Ezekiel passage is still giving me goosebumps. And if this wasn't enough to convince you that we're not just looking forward to heaven, but we are looking back. We are looking back from heaven to this world we live in. Keep going to Revelation chapter 21. Now in Revelation chapter 21, we see the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem finally come to be. Oh, what was that in chapter 7 then? John really loves to repeat himself. And if you haven't read it, I'm going to refer you to our Wednesday Bible studies. And you can go over that and see why John repeats himself. It's really beautiful. But now in Revelation chapter 21, in verse nine, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven final plagues came and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So he took me away in the spirit. Well, that's what happened to Ezekiel, wasn't it? To a huge majestic mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. The city possesses the glory of God. Its brilliance is like a precious jewel, like a stone of crystal clear jasper. It has a massive high wall with 12 gates. And now John is going to tell us quite a lot about this wall. Tell us all about the wall, John. Tell us how wonderful it is. What do you expect from a wall? John's going to really tell us a lot about this wall. It's a beautiful wall. In fact, we expect a wall would keep people out. That's usually what a wall does when you build a wall around a city, is it keeps out the invaders. But John isn't envisioning that kind of wall because this wall has come from heaven above. This wall doesn't serve our purposes. It doesn't serve authoritarian or nationalist purposes. It serves God's purpose. And John's about to tell us what that kind of wall looks like. He continues in verse 12. It has a massive high wall with 12 gates. Well, that's not very secure, isn't it? That's four gates on each side. With 12 angels at the gates. And the names of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel are written on the gates. I've heard a lot of anti-Semitic sermons over the years. And I think there's nothing more, more, more telling than that the nation that the, 12, the names of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel are written on the 12 gates of God's holy city where he expects all us Christians to end up. He expects Israel to be there. In fact, this is their city. 
this is their neighborhood. How do I know? Because he goes on in verse 14, the wall of the city has 12 foundations and on them are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. It's God's holy city, but guess what? It's still Israel. So Christians, Gentiles, all of us, where's our place in this holy city? There's 12 gates for a reason. It says in verse 15, the angel spoke, who spoke to me had a golden measuring rod with which to measure the city and its foundation stones and wall. Now the city is laid out as a square, its length and width the same. He measured the city with the measuring rod at 1,400 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to human measurement, which is also the angels. The city's wall is made of jasper, and the city is pure gold, like transparent glass. The foundations of the city's wall are decorated with every kind of precious stone. And the 12 gates are 12 pearls. Each one of the gates is made from just one pearl. And the main street of the city is pure gold, like transparent glass. This is where we get the expression, the pearly gates, from this one passage here, this one verse. Revelation 21, 21, with the pearly gates. And pearls are wonderful things, aren't they? They're, in fact, kosher. You can eat them. I don't recommend it. But you can. You can dissolve them in wine and drink them. And they are, in fact, kosher. That said, they come from an animal which is not kosher. The meat of an oyster is unclean. But it produces pearls. It must be, it must have been very interesting to have been an oyster farmer in, in first century Israel because you can extract the pearls but not eat the meat. What do you do with the meat? Nothing is ever wasted in God's economy. And in God's holy city, guess what? There's a place for that unclean meat as well. In, Verse 22, he goes on, Now I saw no temple in the city because the Lord God, the all-powerful, and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God lights it up and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations, that's us, the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their grandeur into it. There's the nations. You see, there is God's holy city, but guess what? There's still a whole new earth and new heaven, and God made new nations. God expects us to be there, and these pearly gates are his invitation. Because the 12 names of the 12 tribes, the 12 names of the 12 apostles are on those gates but the gates are made of pearl, a contradiction in itself. And they mark the way from unclean to clean. They're an invitation to the nations. Go outside and eat your oysters and bring in your pearls. Come, you nations who once plundered Israel, you who extracted Israel, from your colonies to Rome, come and bring your art, bring your jewels, bring everything of value, everything that is beautiful and wonderful about you and bring it into God's holy city. But nothing ritually unclean will ever enter into it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or practices falsehood, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, even out in the nations. 
God's will is known because God is shining like the sun from that holy city. The pearly gates are a symbol of inclusion. They stand as a reminder that no one will ever be left out. Not because of where they came from, not because of who they are, not even because of what they eat or how they dress. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God because those gates are clean. Just as God told Peter, what I have made clean, do not call unclean. And just as Jesus said, when he talked about dough that was set apart, one piece to be baked for the off for the temple offering. But if that were the temple offering, but if that one piece is clean, if it is acceptable to be offered to God, then what about the rest of the dough? The whole gospel tells us that we are loved all of humanity and these pearly gates stand as a reminder forever that God will never close the gates in fact in verse 24 the nation will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their grandeur into the city its gates will never be closed during the day, and there will be no night there. You will always be able to find your way to that city. And you will always be welcome because the gates will never be closed. Chapter 22 and verse 1, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, water as clear as crystal, pouring out from the throne of God and of the Lamb, flowing down the middle of the city's main street. On each side of the river is the tree of life, producing 12 kinds of fruit. Isn't that amazing? You know, we're about to study Genesis again. And when God created this world, he put humanity into a garden. And when we left that garden, we went and built a city and put walls around it to keep out any, any would-be invaders. And here God has built a city with walls that are made to never keep anyone out. He's placed within it a garden and only the tree of life. producing its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month of the year. Its leaves are for the healings, excuse me, its leaves are for the healing of the nations. Not only will there be nations, but we will never stop coming closer to God. We will have all eternity to learn his ways and we will never, ever be done. That sounds monumental. To some, that may sound like the work of Sisyphus. But I think it sounds incredible that no matter how long we have, there's always more to learn, more to do, people to serve, and a God who will never stop loving us, who will never stop calling us home. And he asks that we come into his city knowing that we bear treasures that he put within us. For you see, we really are the oysters and we come to his city bearing pearls. For that is the glory of the nations, how God has made each and every one of us different just like the stones that adorn the walls of the city, so very different and yet beautiful in our own way. And all he asks is that we bring that beauty into his city. 
and he's going to need every last one of us to do it. So the leaves of the tree of life. Yes, there are 12 fruits for the 12 tribes and 12 months for the 12 apostles. But even its leaves go out to every nation. And there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. His servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more, and they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, because the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. I like God's idea of heaven. I like John's idea of heaven here. It is beautiful. And I think the most beautiful thing about it is that we will all be there. That we will all be there to sing praise to God. It makes me think of that old song, When All of God's Singers Get Home. You know, we always sing it at funerals, but it has to be the happiest song that I know. And whether singing it in joy or in lamentation, it always brings me to tears. Because I know that I will not be separated from all the people that I love. That I love. I know that none of us will because God will never close those gates. We can be far from the gates. We can be on the other side of the world from Jerusalem, but the leaves of the tree of life are still there for us. If only we will take them and accept the healing that God is offering. God is not looking to change us. God is not looking to make us into something that we were never meant to be. But God is looking to change our outlook. To let us see the wonderful, beautiful being that he has made. All he asks is that we take from the tree of life our healing and bring the beauty that he made for each and every one of us in our own way. Bring that into his city. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you have spent the time for eons making each and every one of us lord in your image and yet each one totally unique lord help us see the beauty in our hearts let help us see the beauty in our souls lord and help us see the beauty in one another that we can reach out to that tree of life that you have provided that you have nurtured that you have fed with the waters of life lord let us reach out to that tree and accept the healing that you have so abundantly offered so that we can bring all the glory, all the beauty, all the honor that you deserve into your city, Lord, to lay it at your feet. In your son's name we pray. Amen.